Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the case may be. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, we did. We had some family over, and it was just a wonderful time of being able to gather together, to be thankful together, to eat together, which we did a lot of, and a lot of food, and it was all wonderful. And uh, like I said, it was just, we have so much to be thankful for just as a family. And uh, it was great to be able to get together and to share that time together and to share those uh, Thanksgivings together with our Lord. And that's that's what we did. We, we are so blessed as a family to to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to have submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, and to know that we will all spend eternity together. What a blessing that is. And guys, the reason we know that, and we can see that right now in the lesson title, is that Jesus is alive. And because he is alive, because he died for us, and because he is alive today, we know that we can also spend eternity with him and with others, other children of Christ, others who have submitted to him and have accepted him as Lord and Savior. And I hope that if you've never done that, that you'll do that. Um, and, and like I said, today's lesson is 100% about that. Uh, so guys, just, just go ahead and bow for a word of prayer and jump right into uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 14. Let's pray. Lord God, we are just so humbled by the blessings and by the joy that you give us in this life. Father, we're undeserving of both, but we know that both come from you. All good things come from you, and that even in the midst of whatever struggles we might be going through, that, Father God, you in us bring us joy. And, Father, may we go out each and every day, those of us who have you in our hearts, may we put that on display. May we share the joy that you've given us with others. Father, we pray that you would give us forgiving hearts. We pray that you would give us loving hearts. And Father, we just pray that in all that we do, that we might bring glory to you because you deserve that, you alone. Not us, not our friends, not anybody but you. Father, we just thank you so much for loving us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. All right, guys, let me go ahead and jump up here, play from start. Uh, the title is... Um, I don't know what I did with my clicker thingy, so here it is. Uh, Alive, Mark 16, verses 1 through 14, Jesus' empty tomb attests to his resurrection. Jesus is alive because the tomb is empty, and guys, that's significant. So as we get started, have you ever been to a grocery or any other kind of store? You, you've been meandering through the aisles, carefully selecting the things that you need to get, putting back the things that you probably just don't need. Then you finally get to the checkout line and either your card is not accepted or you didn't bring your money. You didn't bring cash. Or in my instance, you forgot your wallet or something of that nature. How did it feel? Because most of us have been in a situation like that. Guys, it's embarrassing. You get up there and, and you just don't have the money. All right. And you probably feel the blood rushing to your face and you can feel the warmth in your cheeks and it's embarrassing. And you just know that everybody in the store is staring at you. It's uncomfortable for the cashier. Uh, he or she are standing there just looking at you like they can't do anything or maybe try a different card or, uh, you know, any of a number of things. And they, in your mind, they're thinking, oh, this person, they're in a financial crisis. They don't have, they don't have any money. Uh, and, and you probably even want to explain yourself to the cashier or maybe to other people on the line. Oh, I've got money. That's, that's not the issue. And, and you want to plead your case and you might even pull out your phone and say, here's my bank account. Look, I've got a thousand dollars or I've got, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, and, and you do that probably thinking that the cashier might just say, oh, yeah, you've got the money. You just go on and, and just have the bank call us next week and, and transfer the funds. Uh, there's no doing that. Guys, there's been times I've just had to abandon my cart and go home and get money. You know, and I tell somebody, this is my cart. Um, I'm going to come back with money and thinking they might look at me and go, you don't have any money. You're not coming back. Uh, so why is it important to us that people believe us? Why is that important? And it really goes really to our character. Broke or not, we want people to trust us 
And we often do what we can to prove that we're trustworthy, to, to prove that, that we have the money or that we are good for our word. So how does proof give us courage? And when there is evidence, when there is solid proof, we tend to be a little more bold in presenting our arguments. You know, I was, I was sharing with uh, our son the other night that, you know, there were times when, uh, you know, I would tell my wife at the end of the month, I'd say, look, don't write any checks. Don't use your debit card. Let's spend cash. Let's spend the money we've got because I really don't know which checks are out there and it's tight on this end. And we just, we're going to have to be extremely careful here. But guys, knowing that there's money in the account gives us more confidence. Okay. And, and I want you to just, and the reason I mention that is think about the disciples and their reaction to the crucifixion of Jesus. Where did they go afterwards? What did they do and why? And then I want you to think about what changed in their lives that they were willing to go out to share the gospel and become martyrs for Jesus Christ. So just kind of keep that in mind. So let's look at the first set of verses and it does come from Mark chapter 16 and we'll just do verses one through four. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? Looking up, they noticed that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. So guess what prompted these ladies to go to the tomb early on Sunday morning? They left at dark so they would get there at sunrise. What, what prompted them to do that? And it's to finish the process of anointing the body of Jesus. You see, Jesus and the two criminals hung on their, on their crucifixes um, right before the Sabbath. So the, the two men who hung on either side of Jesus, they broke their legs to speed up the process of dying so they could get them down and get them buried before sunset. With Jesus, they didn't have to do that. But guys, there was an urgency to getting him buried. Everything was kind of sped up. They wrapped him in linens. They, they anointed the body very quickly and, and to get this done before the Sabbath. And they wanted to show up and further anoint his body. Okay, and part of it is, you know, with, with our burial processes today, um, there are things that are delayed and it's not so much the case back then. And they wanted to, to keep his body smelling good so that as people went to visit the tomb, there wouldn't be an awful stench, an awful odor. So guess what concerns did they have as they made their way to the tomb? And we know through these verses, they were very specific in some of them, but you know, I'm thinking that, you know, they had to have had all sorts of things rolling through their minds. Like how would they get in and who might also be there? Might there be Roman guards? Because one of the things that they had done is they had sealed the entrance to the tomb so that there would be evidence of tampering. Nobody would be able to get into that. Would there be guards there? Would there be members of the Sanhedrin there? Uh, would they have been refused passage? Like, no, you're not going to get into this body. Did we bring enough oil and enough uh, of these herbs to be able to properly anoint him? And I would say that being out so early in the morning, they may have even had some concerns for themselves. Maybe, maybe not. You know, one of the things that I did read by the author of this lesson in Lifeway was that uh, Jews tended to get rolling early in the morning. You know, 5, 5.30 in the morning was not uncommon. So well before daylight, but they wanted to get there as soon as the Sabbath was over so they could go about their business of anointing his body. But what did they discover upon their arrival? The stone had been rolled away. So the one thing that was mentioned in here is that they, they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? That was their concern. How would they get into the body? They get there and that's not a concern. The tomb has already been rolled away. Well, how important a lesson do we learn? And what important lesson do we learn from these passages? And for me, it's trust God. Even before they understood that Jesus was gone, Jesus is not in that tomb. Even before they comprehended that Jesus is alive, 
the concerns that were weighing on their minds were taken care of by God. All right. God provides and protects when we trust him. Things may not turn out like we want. And I don't, I don't want us to go away and say that, you know, if, if God doesn't take care of things the way we want him to, then God didn't do for us what he should have done. That is not true. God always wants what's better for us. Even if we don't understand it, we have to trust him. And as these women, the one concern that they had is, how are we going to get the stone rolled away? They show up and it is rolled away. That should not have even been a concern. God is in control. That's, that's one of the ways that God speaks to me in these verses, these first four verses here. Trust him. He's got it. He's got things taken care of. And you know what they wanted to do? Think about this for a minute. They wanted to go rub oil and, and spices on the covered linen-covered body of dead Jesus. Their concern was, how are we going to get the stone rolled away? And what do they find? That tomb is empty. Not only do they not need the oil and spices, Jesus is alive. That's awesome. All right. So uh, oh, and let me back up here. I, I've fast forward. Let me go ahead and read the verses before we get into this question. So verses five through eight. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they put him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. They went out and ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. So guys, why was the stone stone? Why was the stone rolled away when they arrived? It's so that they could go in. What an awesome, awesome thing to be able to know as a Christian. Guys, the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. Jesus didn't need doors. Jesus didn't need stones. He didn't need barriers. He didn't need crowds to keep him from going where he was going to go. But in order for these ladies to go in and see that Jesus wasn't there, the stone was rolled away. The stone was rolled away so that we would have evidence that the tomb was empty. Guess who was the man in the tomb then? Was it Jesus? Was it Jesus sitting there? And it wasn't. This was an angel. And other gospels revealed that there was an angel, some revealed there were two angels that were sitting on, you know. So, you know, same stories, kind of different remembrances of events here, but same thing that was happened. But, but guess, this angel had come for a specific purpose, and it was to be there to meet the women, to greet the women as they came, and to calm them. Notice that the first thing that he said to them was to not be afraid, to calm down. Don't, don't be afraid here. Um, and, and that's not precisely what it said, but he said, don't be alarmed is the way that it's translated in the, in the home and Christian standard. So, uh, but also guys, not just to calm their fears, but to inform them about what they were seeing. You came to see Jesus of Nazareth, but he's not here. He has risen. And they looked and they saw the linen cloth that he had been wrapped in. They saw the, the head linen lying there where his body had been placed two days before. And on the third day, he's now arisen. All right. But he also was there to instruct them as to where to go and what to say. So was there anything odd about the angel's instructions here? Jesus had told the disciples over and over, I'm going to die. I'm going to be going to rise on the third day. And then he also told them he would meet them in Galilee. Well, that's not odd. Nothing odd, nothing strange about that, that, well, other than Christ is risen, that, that's different. But the instructions, I thought it was interesting that he said, go tell his disciples and Peter. Well, Peter's one of his disciples. So, but he called out Peter specifically here. And I thought in that moment, that's a little odd. And as I read through the commentary, I was reminded 
number one, and not in the commentary, but you know, when I read some of the other gospels, when the ladies got back and they told the disciples, Peter and John didn't hesitate. They took off at a sprint. They ran to the tomb to see for themselves. Okay. But these men were leaders. These were part of the inner circle. Peter was one of the closest of Jesus's friends and confidants, his closest disciple. You see, Jesus is still using them. And for Peter, you think about the last time that Peter was with Jesus. He was in the courtyard in the, in the morning that he was being uh, questioned by the Sanhedrin and the chief priest, and he denied Jesus. Guys, this news might have meant more to him than to the others, because he had denied Jesus. Now Jesus is saying, go tell Peter, I'm alive. Yeah. Again, Jesus thinking about us more than himself. What lesson do we learn from these women? What did, did they learn upon receiving this task? They ran. Now, now they ran for, I think, multiple reasons. We're told they, they were trembling and they were astonished and overwhelmed with fear. They were afraid. But they did what they were instructed to do, even though they were afraid. They were afraid because the tomb was empty. They were afraid because they were spoken to by an angel. They were afraid because now they have to go tell the disciples that Jesus is alive and that doesn't make sense. And that in that culture, women weren't to be believed. There had to be male witnesses as well. But guys, they overcame their fear by trusting in God. And I think about the same thing for us that, that you know, oftentimes we probably don't share the gospel with others out of fear. What will that do to our relationship? What will people think of us? Uh, will people believe us? Or will they say, you know, that's nonsense. That's crazy talk. And some people will. But guys, these women did as they were told by an angel of the Lord. Jesus has told us what to do with our knowledge of the gospel. We are to share that even if we're afraid to do so. All right, let's look at the last set of verses here, and it's verses 9 through 14. Uh, early on the first day of the week, after he had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, uh, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping. Yet when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it, just as she had feared. After this, he appeared in a different form to two of them walking on their way in the country. And they went and reported it to the rest who did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had risen. Guys, earliest discovered manuscripts of this gospel did not include these verses. I just find that interesting. Uh, guys, if the earliest manuscripts did not include these particular verses, verses 9 through 14, are they true? Can they be trusted? Did somebody else write those and stick them in? I mean, we probably can't believe them, right? Yes, first of all, and this is important that we go back to this, we know that all of these events occurred because the other gospels confirm them. Secondly, most everything that I have ever written, I've had to go back and edit. This lesson, I've had to go back, and there's still mistakes in it, but I have to go back when I found them and went back through them, I had to edit some things and then save it and go back through again. That's just what you do. But finally, and I think the most compelling of the evidence is all scripture is God breathed and worthy for teaching, rebuking, instructing. We're told that by God himself. But I think also the, these verses, he may not have put in the earliest manuscripts. And then as he went back and rethought that, he was like, oh yeah, he told me this, that, and the other, and I have to include that. So what was the most common reaction of the disciples upon learning that Jesus is alive? First, the women went back and told him. Then Mary Magdalene had gone back and Jesus met her in the garden and said, go back and tell him. Peter and John ran. And then 
uh, another time he had met uh, two of the disciples on the road to Emmaus and, and uh, told them, go back and tell the others. And each time there was disbelief. They heard others telling of seeing Jesus alive, Mary Magdalene, the two other disciples, and each time they didn't believe. They did not believe because they did not witness the risen Savior. They saw Jesus dead, and they believed that. That they believed. Guess how much are we like that? How much are we uh, uh, so driven by we have to believe what we see? And it's just like sometimes our eyes deceive us. All right? Sometimes we just have to trust. Like I have never seen the earth from another place, like for instance, the moon. I've seen pictures of it. It makes sense. I, I can't see uh, uh, the ocean uh, that, that ends someplace else because of the curve. So I just believe things even if I can't see them. They disbelieved, but what changed their minds? When Jesus appeared to all of them as they were dining, as they were hiding from the authorities. And if you'll remember from other gospel accounts, the door was locked to the building in which they were reclining and eating. And then Jesus appeared before them in a body, in his body, not as a ghost, not as a spirit, but, but as Jesus Christ. And even then it was difficult for many of them to believe. If you'll remember, there was one disciple in particular, Thomas, who wanted to be able to touch the scarred hands of Jesus, to put his hand in his side, and Jesus said, do those things so that you might believe. Guess what obstacles keep people from believing today? And most, most of them are the same. Okay, We have to see to believe. For most of us, it's the same thing. Many would prefer that it not be true, and therefore they don't have to answer to anyone. And I really believe that's the hardness of the heart that Jesus referred to in his disciples. People don't want to have to answer to the Lord. They don't want to have to answer to the supernatural. And smart people question the gospel and the risen Savior. Happens all the time. Guys, I, I, I'm kind of one of these people, I watch little clips of, of news, uh, little clips of interviews, things of that nature, and I hear people talk about that, that, that are really smart people, and why they can't, this can't be true, and things of that nature. But also, you know, billions worship Allah, billions worship Muhammad, they worship Buddha, they worship Brahma, they worship all sorts of other gods, and very devout people, they're sold out to their faith, are they all wrong, these billions of people? Are they going to hell? Yes, they are. Unless they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and confess their sins and accept him as Lord and Savior, they're wrong. Yes, Jesus died on that cross and he rose from, from that grave to save us. And it is only through him that we can be forgiven and saved. Yes, our hope isn't in all these other things. Our hope is in the Lord. Jesus is risen. Guys, there is great hope in that. And I just pray that whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is that's eating at you, and I know, guys, we have friends, we have people in our class, brothers and sisters in Christ, who are going through very, very difficult times right now. Guys, our hope isn't in anything other than the Lord, and that is sufficient. Yes, I hope that you just cling to the sufficiency of Christ today. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. Love you. Take care. Hope to see you soon.